Hello there, and welcome to my top 100 for 2017. Uh, it's it's been two years since I've done one of these. Uh, I guess there was one in 2013 and one in 2015, and here we are now, the summer of 2017. In fact, specifically, this was put together in mid-June of 2017. Uh, in, in fact, the reason I, I tell you this is because there are some games, of course, that I have played since then that I, I may have put on the list. In fact, for sure. This one. Ryan Lockett's Near and Far would definitely be on the list somewhere, but I had to cut it off. Um, this is a, a lovely game. I'm going to call it number 101, even though it would probably be farther up on the list. Um, still, awesome. I'm going to put it away now. I had to cut it off somewhere because you have to start tabulating, you know, and start actually producing the list. I used a, um, a program, an online uh, service called Pub Meeple to make this edition of the Top 100. It basically uses the same system that Tom uh, has, has talked about in the past. The index card method, where you compare two games and say which one you like better and split up piles that way. This system does that. It took maybe seven or eight hundred matchups before I had a, 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 a final list that I was happy with. And there were a couple of surprises in here. There are 31 new games in the top 100. Almost, almost a third of, of the games are new. And the really interesting thing is that there are some games that came back that were away. They were in my 2013 list. They were away in the 2015 list, and now they're back. And I'm, I'm sort of coming to terms with how that happened. You know, when I, I just matched up games, I like this one better, I like this one better, I like this one not as much as this one. And, and these sort of floated back up to the top again. And um, it could be that they've hit the table more recently and sort of reinvigorated my interest in them, or, or just they've held up better as other newer games have fallen down the list. It's interesting. Anyway, here we go. Let's do it. Top 100. Begin. 100. Space Cadets Dice Duel. We'll kick things off with an Engelstein party joint. This is Space Cadets Dice Duel, which is the, uh, the second iteration of the Space Cadets system. Uh, this is a real-time dice rolling team-based game, uh, which I think really shines when you add in the Die Fighter expansion, which allows you to play with up to five players on each team, and gives one player this tiny little zippy thing that, that has sort of a limited array of dice actions that flies around and tries to do damage, while the other group is, uh, is sort of, they've got different stations, and uh, they're, one is moving the ship, and one is pre prepping weapons, and one is defending against the other ships, and a captain is directing everything as, as uh, all of this chaos happens really neat party game uh, that I, I really enjoy. I like the space theme as well. Space Cadets Dice Duel, number 100. 99. Star Trek Fleet Captains. Number 99 goes to Star Trek Fleet Captains. Now this is the expansion box. The uh, the real one's much bigger than this. It's it's down there. It's, you know, it's like this big. Uh, the only downside that I have to this is that I haven't been able to fit this into that box. Um, I, I just, I can't get rid of the insert. The inserts are so nice and they fit the ship so well and I feel like I'm gonna have to dismantle things if I want to. Anyway, of the Star Trek games I've played, uh, this is the most like Star Trek. Uh, I, I have not played everything that's out there, but I really like the way this works. You're flying through space, discovering planets, sometimes it's an exploratory mission and sometimes you gotta shoot stuff. Um, the the playtime can be a little long, which is why it hasn't hit the table very much lately. Uh, so I fear this one might be on the bubble a little bit in the top 100. It's sort of fallen in the last few years, but I still I still really like playing with those ships. It's so much fun. Uh, Star Trek Fleet Captains, my number 99. 98. Red Seven. Number 98 goes to Red 7, a quirky little game from Chris Seslick and Carl Chuddick from Osmati Games. Um, a game in which, in each play of the game, you need to be winning at the end of your turn or else you've lost. 
So you have to sort of change the rules of the game or play a better card uh, in order to be winning by the end of your turn. Uh, you can play one or two cards. So, you know, it's sort of this limited palette of things you can do, but there's a lot of strategy and, and, uh, and, and, and machinations to, to work with in this game. But still, it plays quickly. Uh, you can easily deal up another round if, if things don't go terribly well for you. Uh, it's, it's a neat twist on trick-taking. It's almost not really a trick-taking. Uh, there's a little bit of that in there. But it's, it's definitely a twist on the whole card game uh, genre. Red 7, number 98. 97. Risk... Legacy. You know when a game has a handle that it's a good one. Uh, this is Risk Legacy. Uh, this is my sealed copy of Risk Legacy. I bought two when the game came out uh, so that I could play with my kids and they are getting very very close to that age that I could. I could probably play with my older son um, but the younger would I think not take well to the <laughs> the combat of Risk quite yet, but still. Uh, risk Legacy takes the concept of Risk and, and adds some permanence to the different games. This was the first game to do that in a Legacy format. Uh, I still love it. I, I think that permanence adds weight to your decisions in this game. Uh, and, and I, you know, folks have tried to take Legacy games and make them reversible. Uh, yeah, I understand the the idea of that, but uh, I think you need to, to get the full experience, you need to be actually marking up the board, the board, the components, making those permanent changes, knowing you can't take them back. Uh, and, and I look forward to playing this with my kids. Uh, one thing I've heard about this game is that um, the glue holding some of the stickers on cards has not aged well, so I'm a little worried about what I'll find when I open this up. But still, the experience should be a blast with my two kids getting to play this after having played it with adults the first time through. And it's been a couple years. I think I think I may be surprised by a couple elements of Risk Legacy. It's my number 97. Looking forward to playing it with my kids. Boom! 96. Escape, Curse of the Temple. Number 96, Escape, The Curse of the Temple, the real-time dice-rolling cooperative game. Uh, I still, still really enjoy this one. There's this exploration aspect, you're exploring the temple, but there's a soundtrack as you're playing along, and when you hear that gong, everybody has to rush back to the center, uh, or they're going to lose some dice, and it's going to make things a lot more difficult for you. Eventually, you're trying to escape from the whole thing. Uh, expansions add more crazy tiles. I have maybe two or three expansions in here. I don't have the full set and array of these because there's plenty to work with here. I'd like to play this with my kids, uh, and I don't want too much complexity, but there's plenty to play with, even with just the base set in Escape. Um, it's a blast. It's, it's a lot of fun. This may get supplanted by Magic Maze, uh, which has not made the list, I don't think. Uh, but, but, you know, I need to play that one some more before I can really evaluate the two. For now, Escape, Curse of the Temple, is a great family cooperative dice-rolling escape game. It's my number 96. 95. No thanks. Number 95 goes to the dead simple abstract card game Geschenkt, or also um, no thanks for the English-speaking audience. Uh, it's You simply want to avoid taking cards, taking points uh, to, to place in front of you, and you do that by putting chips on the cards you don't want to take. I don't want this, and it goes to the next person, they can put a chip on it or take it, but then when they take it, they get all the chips that come with that card. Uh, so there's a little bit of subtlety, timing that goes here. There's also this system where if you take an adjacent card, you only take points for the lowest of those cards. If I have the 14 and the 15, I only have 14 negative points. Uh, so, so there's a little pusher luck there, too. Of uh, you know, I, I know I'm the only one that's going to not take any points for taking this card. So do I let it go around the table a couple times to earn chips, which are worth good points? Good points versus bad points. Like I said, some subtlety, but so simple that pretty much anybody can play this game. Uh, it's extremely versatile card game to pull out with whoever. It's my number 95. No thanks. 94. Ent Decker. Which used to be my number one game. Uh, Ent Decker, Exploring New Horizons. I still bring this out every once in a while and, and still just get a tremendous amount of joy of building the world. You're exploring different... Uh, sides of the board and finding islands and then it's an area control game as you place influence on those islands once those islands are complete they then score and you'll get points based on 
you know, whether you have the most presence on the island or not. Uh, there's three different types of influence. You can place little dudes, you can place forts, you can place huge settlements, which cost more money, but are worth more influence when the whole thing's done. Uh, different map setups. It, yeah, there's a, there's a good amount of luck involved here, because it's a tile drawing game, and, uh, you know, you can get totally hosed by the tile draw. Still, I love the world building. This has a Carcassonne feel to it. Uh, you know, tile laying, exploration. This pushes a lot of good buttons and still remains a favorite. Ent Decker, my number 94. 93. Puzzle Strike. 93 is Puzzle Strike, the bag building, deck building sort of game where you're trying to send gems to your opponents. It's based on a puzzle video game that doesn't exist based on a fighting game that doesn't exist, right? It's got the characters from Yomi, uh, the fighting game, in a super deformed puzzle version, and you're using chips to attack each other. I, and still, I love the theme. Uh, I don't even know which edition this is. Uh, there have been so many editions of Puzzle Strike, and the rules have, have morphed and evolved as time goes by. I think this is second edition, with maybe some third edition compatible components mixed in. I don't care. I like the system I have in my hands, um, with, with all these chips, and uh, I, this one is one I haven't introduced to the kids yet. Um, and th I think it would go well. Certainly the theme, and I love the different characters, starting with different uh, chips in your bag, and they have a different play style. Um, still super fun to, to pull this out and, and just shuffle some chips in your bag. Puzzle Strike, number 93. 92 of AXA. All right, going to try something different for those games that I don't have in my collection. I'm going to use Google Image Search to show you a picture of Alf. Axa. This is a pickup and deliver game using trucks. Uh, the base map is a map of Germany, and uh, you're, you're picking up contracts uh, of different different quantities of goods that go in your nice little trucks, and then you trek along and deliver them. Um, but it's definitely, you're, you're bidding on these contracts, so you have to spend some of the money that is eventually victory points to get these contracts in the first place, and depending on how much you bid for them, these bids are sort of set, you, uh, you may be paying more of your profit than, than you'd like. You have to decide, is this worth it in order for me to actually make enough money on getting this contract in the first place? So I like the crunchiness of the economic system. Um, it's a little tricky if you're not as familiar with German geography. <laughs> it's, it can be a little, a little tough to, um, to know where you're supposed to go. There are uh, fan-made versions with U.S. maps, um, which is kind of cool. And this is one that, that keeps coming up uh, when I make these sorts of lists, and I still really enjoy it. Auf Oxa. It's my number 92. 91. Emmet Domain. Emmet? Emmet Domain. Emmet. Emmet Domain. Eminent. Oh. All right, let's finish off this set of 10 with Eminent Domain. I still have, this is my first edition copy with Seth Jaffe's signature right there. Check it out. Uh, Eminent Domain is a deck builder, one of the early wave of deck builders. Uh, but the way you acquire cards is interesting because you, you get cards that, that allow you to do a certain action when you do that action. So the more you do a particular action, the better you get at doing it. Because uh, when, you, when you execute an action, you then... Uh, can sort of add to that. You can play multiple versions of a particular card in order to make it a stronger version of that action. So the more of, a, say, a green card or a trade card I have in my hand, the better my trade action is going to be. So the more of that card I have in my deck, the better chance I have of getting a strong version of that. So it's this, this sort of deck learning game. It's pretty neat. Uh, Eminent Domain, this is another one that hasn't hit the table as much recently, and I really should remedy that, because there's a lot to explore in here. Uh, and still, still, in my mind, it, it hits the top, you know, yeah, one of the top uh, 100 games. 91, to be exact. Eminent Domain. And there we go. The first 10 are complete. 90 more to go. I'm excited. Let's do this thing. We'll see you next time. He's got a voice that's really the bomb. He'll make a choice that'll aggravate Tom. I hate to spoil it, but when all said and done, Merchant of Venus gonna be number one. Every summer, the top one.